in short-term finance to Africa. And if the crisis is only short, that will be sufficient and then allow some discussion about debt going on down the road. Perhaps the big unknown in this, which I've already partly alluded to, is China. You know, I would argue very strongly that in the world where the US is probably not that interested in talking about African debt relief, whether the Chinese government see this as a major diplomatic opportunity. And if they were to come around and say to Angola, which has a very high redemption schedule, or if you think about it, the Kenyans say, well, we'll, we'll write off or reprofile the, the railway debt in Kenya. I think you would hear some very receptive voices. So I think a lot of this will depend on how China acts. Is China prepared to act bilaterally. If it's quite happy to write off debt, then the debt burden will be significantly reduced across a large number of African countries. And they may not feel a need to write off um, multilateral or other bilateral debt, uh, certainly not eurobond debt. So I think the first step is we give money, we push it through the multilaterals, we see how China reacts, and then maybe we discuss debt relief at some point down the road in 2021. But I think, as you said, those complications will be co uh, those discussions will be very complicated. But as I've pointed out to various people at various times, also remember there's one big bazooka in the room here. The big bazooka, as I argue, is Zambia, which we don't often think about. But Zambia owns a 750 million euro bond bullet point redemption in after the August 2020 elections, and so in August uh, in 2022. And unless Zambia makes a very radical change of policy course in the coming months, it just will not be able to pay that. So in a way, you could get to 2022, and if Zambia cannot repay that, you would then look around and Zambia would say, well, what has Argentina done? What has Lebanon done? What has Ecuador done? Should we be seeking some sort of debt rescheduling program? And from then, it might well have washed up into Africa anyway. So what you could argue is that this COVID-19 coronavirus crisis is just bringing all that forward, right? Maybe we were hitting this point in 2023, 22, 23. Now we're going to hit it in 21, 22, basically. So, so we have an acceleration of this discussion on what are we really going to do about African debt? And you chalk that into the um, Silver Linings Club. Is that, is that a useful thing to have brought that forward? I think it depends which way you look at it. I would still argue that Africa doesn't have a debt problem. Africa has a government revenue problem. Sure. And I don't mind. I, I've become more, as I've got older in life, I've become more relaxed about debt rescheduling. I kind of <laughs> debt write-offs. You should talk I to my bank of, manager. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, yeah. If I say it in front of the bankers at Citibank, they get very nervous. But as the economist, <laughs> it doesn't really matter too much to you in a way. Uh, you know, I've seen Argentina. Argentina has been through multiple defaults at times. And you might say, well, actually, there, sometimes it doesn't look so bad <laughs> there. But look, the reality is that I, I, I would only want to see a debt write-off if I believed it would give us more political will to actually address the fundamental causes of Africa's debt crisis, which is government revenue. If you're not going to do that, you know, then, you know, there's not much point in, in going through the whole difficulty of a debt write-off because, you know, very quickly you'll come back to the same problem. In a way, what HIPIC shows you is that we wrote off the debt and very quickly we got back to square zero. Um, so I think we need to work out how we put in place that, that situation where governments are addressing the revenue question. And, but we have to be realistic. Donors and people who support Africa have to be realistic. You want democracy in Africa, you claim, but democratically elected governments don't like asking for more tax. How do you start squaring those circles? So I think, you know, the needs, what I hope is it leads to a much more realistic policy debate about where we go in Africa. Does that include um, talk about transfer pricing and the various tricks that um, big multilateral, uh, multilateral, big uh, multinational companies use to ease profits out of the continent uh, and avoid paying tax in various countries? It may do. Um, that could be part of it. But the reality is much more fundamental than that. The reality is that Africa has a tax base that's just too small. 
you know, Kwame Ahimo at the Institute of Economic Affairs in, in Kenya, in Nairobi, he has this joke that you can fit all Kenya's taxpayers in the national stadium. If you look <laughs> at the efforts done by the Ghanaian government, they have a million taxpayers. Now, look, that's just not enough people in a population of 30 million, right? So I think there's lots of things that has to be addressed, how, how you give African tax authorities the ability to, to ensure that there's compliance with the rules, and then how you widen the tax base, which is, is fundamentally more, more important. Um, you, know, you could have the same argument in an industrial economy in a way. I suspect that when some of this is done and dusted in the United Kingdom, the, 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 the goal will be to raise the tax rate for higher income taxpayers. Well, symbolically, that is very good. But in terms of revenue gain, it's probably nothing to compare to what you're doing in terms of changing the, the, the sort of your basic, your, your middle band tax rates where the majority of taxpayers are. So I think you know, Africa has to have a debate about how to widen the tax base and then how to use technology more effectively to, 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 um, to provide that tax. And then finally, what comes out of COVID-19 is a, a, some sort of acceptance that the money has been spent wisely. I mean, if you're a Nigerian, if you're a Kenyan, you would say, well, I don't want to pay tax because look at the public health facilities. We've seen how pathetic they were in coping with something like COVID-19. So governments then have to work out as well how they deliver on some of these taxes if people are paying them. Can we provide better services that make people less resentful about paying taxes in Africa? Given globally the um, the resurgence of the state, uh, as is often the case in, in moments of of crisis, um, do, do you? I mean, how how is this all going to to play out? The the, the various um, governments across Europe, uh, the UK, uh, the US have all re restarted their versions of uh, quantitative easing. Um, there, there appears to be a growing consensus that there, there may even be <laughs> some kind of healthcare reform in, in the US down the line. It, it, what's, what does the structure of the global economy look like over the next two, three, four years? Yeah, that's a hard question. I, I'm more in the school that people say this is a fundamental change. And I think when normality returns, people very quickly slip back to normality. Um, I mean, I think from, from our just a general perspective, I think what it shows you, and, but a trend that may have been apparent even before the COVID-19 crisis, is that many companies will be very worried about their supply chains, particularly their supply chains into China. So I think that's a really interesting question from, a, from an African perspective, whether some of those supply chains are relocated and whether they're just relocated into other Asian countries or perhaps they're relocated into, into Africa um, and that may be a positive boom for the, for, the, for the continent. Are you thinking sort of manufacturing, supply chains, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's certainly a thought process that we would have to see. I mean, um, you know, if you were a manufacturing component company, would you have more faith going forward in putting more facilities into Morocco or South Africa um, as, as your base rather than in, in China? So I think... The, the, the global supply chain issue is a very interesting one. And what companies will want is that they will want to have global supply chains that cover more countries so you're less exposed to a problem in one country. I think the, the, the drawback of that or the worry for Africa is that you could then see Chinese manufacturing facilities locating into Africa or it could just be brought back into Europe and the U.S., and therefore, Africa, Africa goes back to being more marginalized in all this. I think, you know, you can think from other problems. Does it make some sort of fundamental issue about flying going forward? You've already had these worries about global warming and, and you know, flight shaming. Uh, if you're an African tourist industry and, and flying, you know, becomes stigmatized not only with things like COVID-19, but carbon dioxide emissions, uh, you know, does that necessarily impact so, you, you, you can look at this two ways. Either it, it breaks up global su supply chains, makes them more geographically diverse, and Africa gets included a bit more, or it leads to a more nationalistic structure where, again, Africa is on the periphery of that, and that would be your worrying outcome out of this. Um, so I, I think it's probably too early to really even think about it. But um, 
you know, it's that sort of debate which will shape where Africa goes in the coming years. I mean, in terms of state government, I'm just not convinced that African governments as states are strong enough to really be involved. I mean, I would be very surprised if you went back to an era where you have uh, Kwame Nkrumah or, or, um, or Jomo Kenyatta or Julius Nyeri, these people pushing this sort of state-led industrialization in Africa. I find that quite remote in my mind. Um, but I think, you know, the debate that where the global supply chain debate goes will be very crucial for where Africa stands. Um, just then on, on the, the different recovery scenarios for the continent, I guess it's very much tied into the commodity prices. Um, but, but um, I mean, you've mentioned in your research that we uh, often underappreciate how quickly uh, the continent can bounce back, certainly after 2008, uh, 2009, it, it bounced back quite quickly. Um, what, what are the possible scenarios uh, this time around? Well, my, still, my central assumption is that this crisis rumbles on in, in Europe and the US for the next three or four months. And, and over, you know, well, we're already seeing provisional signs of it that we, we're seeing in China already coming out of the lockdown. Now, I, 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 you know, going back to where we started, obviously, if COVID-19 does break out in an African country, you know, the next three or four months in that country are going to be extraordinarily difficult and wiped out. And you, you'd, I, I would have to revise down my forecast. But if you assume that Africa manages to sort of muddle its way through the COVID-19 crisis and the global economy starts to recover from August onwards, September, then when you look at most countries, you're really saying that GDP growth slows from the order of 5 6% in the oil importers to round levels of somewhere between 2 and 3 depending how big their agricultural sectors are and how rural they are. Obviously, for the oil importers, we're stuck in a period of low growth, it's anywhere a bit over 0%, uh, 0 to 1, 1.5%. South Africa obviously takes a big hit in all this. Um, so, you know, that's a perfectly bearable cost, I think. And I would expect in 2021, you would start to see Africa recovering. I mean, you need to step back from a lot of this and also remember that a lot of what goes on in Africa and the speed of the recovery will depend on the policy response. And it will depend on things that you know matter more in Africa, whether you know, if the agricultural sector performs well, whether there's rain whether the locust invasions in East Africa kick in in the coming months on the back of a COVID-19 crisis and create a more difficult outcome, whether the Nigerian government does devalue the Naira as I expect it to do. So generally, you know, the lesson I've always taken over uh, from Africa is despite dire warnings of these things, many countries very rarely collapse. One of the lessons that over the decades I've taken out of Africa is that Zimbabwe has never collapsed. Zimbabwe retreats into subsistence or, or effectively the economy informalizes. It retreats from its interaction with the formal sector. And if this crisis is prolonged, that will just happen over a wider range of countries in Africa. That takes you to another point that I keep saying in Africa. People get, you know, you can, you can, get worried and say, oh, well, David's only talking about 2% growth or 3% growth. Just remember, in most African countries, population dynamics are, you know, driving population growth at 2.5%. Taking a Western definition of a recession, two quarters of negative growth, has little meaning in Africa. And in fact, if you were to Google academic meanings of a recession, you'd find that if you, you very quickly move from this popularized version of what is a recession. Um, but effectively, a 2 or 3% growth rate in Africa is incomes per capita stagnating, perhaps even modestly declining. So no, it's, it's still not a good scenario, but we've seen in Africa that it's a scenario that can go on for quite some time when things get bad, essentially. Our thanks to David Cowan for more coronavirus coverage. And to sign up to our daily update, please visit theafricareport.com. Do come say hi at Nick Norbrook or at The Africa Report and on our Facebook page. Until next time, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.